So um, this is actually the story of really the open mind because um, you will see once you um, find out that you have the fellowship, the first thing that Grace and Ashok will start doing is telling you, you need to prepare, who are your contacts, where are you going, what are you doing? So I thought in my mind I have everything set up. I knew where I'm going, I knew what I'm doing, what I'm researching. I wanted to go to archives and study the commercial uh, documents um, of, uh, of the relationship between China and the United States at the end of the 19th, early 20th century. So I knew the archival collections that I wanted to go to. I had set up all my contacts, I was ready to go, and I get to Shanghai and um, the staff at the archives looks at me very nicely and says, well, you don't have affiliation with a Chinese institution. We're really sorry you can't come in. So that was sort of the beginning and the end of my archival research. <laughs> so, okay, yeah, I, I need to somehow do my research. That's why I'm here. So um, immediately that became a, um, a plan B story where I thought, okay, Perhaps I don't have access to the archives, but uh, the only other place where I can get archival documents is actually the museums. And one thing that is beautiful about uh, China, and particularly um, cities like Shanghai and now in Hong Kong as well, is that when you go to the museums, actually the collections are quite amazing. And what was interesting in this case was not only seeing uh, the archival collections that are on display, but also to see what kind of story China wants to tell about itself, about its own past. And that was, uh, in many ways, um, what became actually my own project as well, which I incorporated in my dissertation work and which I will incorporate in my postdoctoral research. So I will kind of, I'm sorry, no contemporary stuff except for the ending. Um, this is mostly a historical story, which goes back to, of course, this person. I don't know if you can see him very well. This is Lin Zixu, uh, a commissioner, Chinese commissioner, who basically is known as uh, the person who started the Opium Wars, or is blamed to have started the Opium Wars. And I will not go into the details of the Opium Wars or what his role was, but. Um, Seeing Lin Zixu in the, the museum and seeing, this is a, um, a what do you call it, a maquette version uh, of, um, of how he destroyed, I don't know, millions and millions worth of opium. A amazing story that started the opium war in, in many ways. Uh, so uh, what is interesting and what, the, uh, returning back to the story of Lin Zixu and the destruction of opium and the wars was, that basically the reason why we have Shanghai and Hong Kong today is because of the international commercial treaties that established these two city ports. So one curious fact that I will share with you, maybe you can't see it very well, but it says on this thing, this is a box for opium. It's government opium, uh, British government opium that was sold in Hong Kong until the end of the Second World War. So while opium was banned everywhere around the world, the government had, the British government had monopoly over the sale of opium because they wanted to tax it in Hong Kong. So um, a lot of the story that I, I could get out of the museum was about these colonial and semi-colonial relationships that China had with the international community. But what became even more interesting is that Again, the narrative that I would get in the museums was not one of the Western imperial oppression, which is what you would usually get if you go to Beijing. I think Beijing, you, you, you go to a lot of monuments, a lot of places, and it says, this is how the imperial powers destroy our world. Not so in Shanghai, not so in Hong Kong. Instead, you see the synthesis between East and West. And both in Hong Kong and in Shanghai, you see a lot of uh, conversation of how the West actually was very conducive to the development of, of the East and how, yes, the West came and they probably intervened a little bit in our affairs, but look how prosperous we are now. So, there, and, and these are kind of uh, examples of 
the West in the beginning of the 20th century. But then you get to this part. Sorry, this is not fast enough. Um, you get to this part. So this is Shanghai. Right? This is in the Museum of Urban Planning. And this is sort of um, the glorious future of Shanghai that they want to um, um, talk about. And they want to uh, present Shanghai as the gate, um, the commercial gate for the entire world. The synthesis between the East and the West. So um, this is again, this is a gigantic um, map, uh, 3D map of Shanghai that is bigger than this entire space. It's it's tremendous. If anybody is interested in things like that. So then the story of Shanghai and Shanghai is, as I said, is pretty much um, a product of the international commercial treaties. But the story that they tell about Shanghai is not uh, how the international commercial treaties destroyed um, local relations or displaced people. The story of Shanghai is a story, at least the one that's portrayed in the museums, is how Shanghai only always had the destiny of becoming this great place. So they even have this crazy um, narrative, uh, and I asked everybody that I knew in China if this is how, how is this possible? They say the, uh, the Shanghai city walls were round, which is conducive to commerce. All the other city walls in the world, in, in China, are squares. It's only Shanghai who has round city walls, and this is good for trade. So I went around and I asked everyone, OK, what's up with the round city walls? And everybody said, we don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so um, again, it, it's a very interesting narrative that's incorporated into the myth of, of Shanghai as, as this place that always had to um, uh, become what it is. So they also have this thing where uh, they have pictures of what Shanghai used to look like in, let's say, the 90s or the 80s and what it looks like now. So there's this progression always towards development, which is in, in many ways very amazing. So one of the things that I found really interesting, and I'll give you this version, is that there, there were only a few subtle ways in which you can see a little bit of, um, of the descent in, in the narrative of the Western world coming into Shanghai and changing everything. So you, you probably cannot read what it says there, but I will only tell you the part that's the most important. So this is the Shanghai Urban History and Development Museum. And in one of the sections, it says in the second hall, there is, um, in the first hall, there's features of the old city. The second hall, foreign concessions and stone frame door house. Third hall, the metropolis infested with foreign adventures. No. What? Infested with? This is not what the Chinese version says, by the way. So it was only in very peculiar ways that uh, you could see a little bit of the descent in, in the Shanghai narrative. But at the same time, I thought this was very productive for my own research. So the only touristy thing that I'm showing you is this building, which I named the Batman. Because it was... <laughs> um, it's not called the Batman, it has a different name, but it was haunting me whenever I was walking around. And so that's my present. 